Tianjuli Wang was born in Shijiazhuang, China. At age seven, she moved to Brooklyn, New York with her parents. And for five years thereafter, the three lived in the shadows of undocumented life in New York City. Chan Julie's first book, Beautiful Country, was both a New York Times bestseller and Read with Jenna Today Show book club pick. Beautiful Country is a poignant literary memoir that follows the family through those years as they held on to hope and joy while confronting poverty, manual labor, and the perpetual threat of deportation. A graduate of Yale Law School and Swarthmore College, where she juggled classes and extracurriculars with four part-time jobs, Chan Julie is now a litigator. She wrote Beautiful Country on her iPhone uh, during her subway commute to and from work at the National Law Firm, where she was elected to partnership within two years of joining the firm. She is now a managing partner of Gottlieb and Wang LLP, a firm dedicated to advocating for education and civil rights. Chan Julie's writing has appeared in major publications such as the New York Times, the Washington Post, Elle, Harper's Bazaar, and The Cut. She regularly speaks on issues such as immigration, education, discrimination, the power of liter literacy in media and at conferences, universities, corporations, community centers, and houses of worship. It is an honor to be able to introduce you all tonight to Chan Julie Wang. One year in junior high, I decided I was going to be cool. I know, typical. What was atypical, though, is that for some reason, I thought that reciting riddles would do the trick. You heard that right. I thought riddles would make me cool. Before you wonder, no, this is not a brain teaser. I spent hours memorizing riddles from books. What can I say? I had a lot of alone time. But I was shocked when, as I shared them, my friends responded with annoyance. If anything, the riddles seemed to make me even less cool. I was, for lack of a better word, puzzled. Mercifully for the human and dogs who had to quarantine with me, I've since forgotten most of those riddles, but I do remember one and sorry, you will not be spared. So here it goes. A man had a book worth $40,000. Only two copies existed. He took the book and threw it into his fireplace. Why? I can imagine it through my screen now, all of you sitting on the edge of your seats I bet you're thinking, wow, how cool is she? Well, just wait till you hear the answer. The man had both copies, and by destroying one, he made the last copy even more rare and increased its value. I remember this riddle because it was the very first I solved on my own. Young as I was, or maybe because of my youth, the answer was obvious to me. The rarer a story is, the more precious it becomes. My parents grew up in China's cultural revolution. My father was just six years old when his teenage brother criticized Chairman Mao in an essay. Instead of starting college, my uncle was thrown into prison, starved and tortured for decades. My father grew up with a dissident label of bad influencer. His home was ransacked, his parents publicly beaten, and teachers targeted him for humiliation every day. He found comfort only at night in the candlelit company of his brother's banned books hidden under the floorboards. My father would go on to become an English literature professor, only to find his lecture halls stifled by censorship. He dreamed of America, in Chinese called Meiguo, literally translated, beautiful country, an apt name for the land of free speech that my father had come to love through the prose of Hemingway and Twain. In 1994, my mother, a math professor, and I joined my father in New York City. I was just seven years old. My life changed overnight. 
I went from dancing at faculty dinners to subsisting with my parents on just $20 a week, attending school in the jaws of hunger every day. After school, I worked next to my mother at a Chinatown sweatshop before she moved on to the sushi plant where she spent 12 hour shifts processing fish and ice water, her skin turning purple. Learning that I was newly quote unquote illegal. I walked the other way whenever I saw anyone in uniform, cop or custodian. The first English word I learned was the slur for Chinese, a word that etched into my brain the certain knowledge that my race was repugnant. But there was also light in my life and it lived in books. I had to speak perfect English to dissuade suspicion about our status, so I threw myself into the public library. There, in the company of Clifford and the Berenstain Bears, I learned word by word what it meant to be a real American kid. But even in that comfort, books reflected my life only in slivers. In the Asian American but suburban household of babysitter Claudia Kishi, in the diary of Anne Frank, whose identity meant that she too had to grow up in hiding, and through the eyes of Jonas, training under the giver, seeing all that was invisible to others. Those glimmers of recognition were even more precious because they were rare. Under their scant light, I felt seen. I hoped that they signaled that I might even be worthy. If America loved them, Perhaps I too could be loved. Perhaps I was not so different after all. From there, there was no separating me from books. That is until fall 2005. In that prehistoric time before TikTok and iPhones, I left the inner city for the lush campus of Swarthmore College. I was an English major my lifelong love for books declared. But in my very first class, a Jane Austen seminar, I realized that I had immigrated once more. For all I had read about my new classmates, who I imagined came straight from Sweet Valley and Stony Brook, I could not speak their language. What had drawn me to college studying books now seemed unattainable because I lacked proper preparation. The professors gave commands like close reading, which I thought required me to hold the book close to my face while reading out loud. Meanwhile, my polished classmates deployed terms like apostrophe, which I thought was just a punctuation mark, and dichotomy, which aptly revealed stark contrast because I didn't even recognize it as English. It hurt most, though, when even the books turned on me. In four years, I read not a single book about undocumented immigrants, about impoverished Asian Americans. This, despite that I sought out ethnic and migratory studies. This, despite that classrooms were filled with words like diaspora and underprivileged, all the more alienating because they were supposed to define me. It was college, not snipping thread for one cent per sweatshop article, not hiding my injuries in fear of the scrutiny a doctor might inflict, not even learning too early that my skin color made me submissive prey, but college that taught me to be ashamed of who I was. My childhood had shown me I was unworthy, but it was college that educated me in the fact that that childhood needed to be buried for me to be an acceptable adult. It is on campuses still, I fear, where many immigrant, underrepresented, and first-generation students continue to learn that lesson. Those in this room might know that those students are not so rare, but I did not at the time. The average freshman cannot know that. All over campus, I weaved lies to obscure my alien history. 
It is telling that even as I wrote a creative writing thesis about the undocumented, determined to find representation in a colleague's text, even if I had to write it myself, I framed it as a novel and disowned my truths. It was not until 2016, some 22 years after I first landed at JFK, that I finally earned my citizenship. Naturalization at long last awarded me the privilege to embrace my past. So I dug up that little girl from the mountain of shame. Dusting her off, I saw for the first time her wisdom, her joy, her worth. From there, I began retracing the experiences that I had spent decades whiting out. In beautiful country, I invite readers to step into that little girl's shoes as she teaches herself English at the public library, as she learns to hide every single crevice of her life, as she falls deeply in love with the country that refuses to see her. By holding a flickering light to my family's early immigrant years, my book makes visible all that remains invisible in our schools and discourse. Beautiful Country is a reminder that Asian American stories are not only worth telling when they perpetuate the model minority myth, that immigrants do not just have value to prove the viability of the American dream. Indeed, both fictions obscure the reality of a nation that so often relies on the invisibility of many millions of its own people. Americans too, who also make this country beautiful. The college years are a shaky bridge between childhood and adulthood, that thorny path of identity exploration. Beautiful country captures the universal truths of childhood, truths from which freshmen are not yet so removed. It guides readers through the secrets and shames that so often divorce us from our authentic selves. The book is a celebration of the dimension, hope, and strength of our country's people. But most of all, it is an ode to the education afforded by rare stories, the ones that reflect the parts of ourselves that we are most afraid to own. Beautiful country will be illuminating to students who have yet to learn about the undocumented and AAPI communities, about poverty and self-compassion. They will discover universal experiences that connect all of humanity, as well as hidden parts of their own hearts. They will also learn that wounds, societal and personal, cannot be healed until they are first seen. Most importantly, though, teaching beautiful country centers the even larger community that lives at its heart. The American children who grow up wondering, where are all the people like me? Where are our stories? Why does our country erase us? Answering these questions has never been more vital. Because even though studying riddles did nothing for my popularity, it did teach me this. The most valuable stories are the rare ones. They unlock the shuttered heart, awaken the complacent mind. They cast light on the unseen forces that govern so much of our lives. They have the unique power to change who we understand ourselves to be as Americans and as humans. And quite frankly, I can't think of anything cooler than that. Thank you.